Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to our Friday Automators Hangout. It's 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. Super exciting. Today, we're super lucky because we have Andy Graham, CEO and Managing Partner from Big C down in lovely St. Petersburg, Florida. They do so many amazing things. They were just Andy, can you tell us about the amazing award you just won last month? <laughs> we won an Inc. Magazine uh, Best Workplaces for 2019 award, which is just a crown wow. jewel of awards we've been winning lately. So that one to me is directly reflective of the work that I do as a leader. So it's, it feels really good. Congratulations. Uh, I saw your Thank video. You. It looked like you were having a super fun time. In the <laughs> Maybe a little too much fun based on the headache I had the next day. But yes, we did have a fun time. <laughs> Cool. So for today, we're going to talk about Agile, and we're going to look at it as a, as a workflow. And we're also going to try and investigate how automations fit into that and if they fit into that at all. Uh, typically, we like to think about this in our framework, which is we look at a big process, we look at all the steps that go through that process, and then we break down each of the steps into micro steps to see if any of those can be automated. So that's kind of like the framework that we should probably use when we address this. Does that make sense to you, Andy? Yep, makes sense. Okay, cool. Can you tell us a little bit about your bio and jump into, into Big C and give us insight into how you guys work? And then sure. we can sort of look at the Agile workflow. Yeah, absolutely. So um, my bio is I have a background in sociology and uh, it has nothing to do with marketing. I'm just kidding. It has everything to do with marketing. But I started my degree in advertising and realized what I liked about it was the behavior change and the theory around behavior change and communication theory. So I went into sociology. Um, I've been marketing forever. I taught myself to code, you know, back in 99, 2000 and uh, started doing some web design and logo design and branding for, for small clients as a freelancer, and then actually started my agency in 2005. Um, so Big C was founded in 2005. Uh, we've been growing since. We merged with another agency in 2016 now. Um, so there's 20 of us total. We have office in St. Petersburg, Florida, and in Colorado Springs. We are primarily, we've, we've kind of morphed from being a web design and development shop with a little bit of marketing to being almost exclusively marketing and the web design stuff is just something we need to do to be better marketers. And so um, we've really transformed that, which has been for two reasons. Number one, monthly recurring revenue is a lot easier to sleep at night around and to plan around from a hiring perspective. And uh, number two, it's what I really enjoy and we have a really strong team who do it. So. So that's us and that's Big C. Um, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. So um, my, I, I warned you in advance that my brain would probably go for it sideways. And I'm just, I just got a note to self to ask you something down the road. Okay. For those of us in, in SEO that don't use an agile workflow in their agency, and I know that you apply it to both web design and development and also SEO and other parts of your marketing stack, but can you tell us a little bit about, you know, high level stuff about what agile is, what mm -hmm. it isn't, um, how you've kind of modified it to work for your agency, and then we'll sort of get into kind of breaking it into all the little steps. Sure. So I have some pretty strong opinions on this and part of it comes from having been consulting or working with uh, one of the founders of the of, Ag the Ag of Agile. Um, he was one of the authors of the Agile Manifesto and he's been a client of ours for the past two years and has been what he calls guerrilla consulting with us, which I love. So he comes in and he's like, oh, if we're going to do the project, here's how we're going to do it. And here's another process we could use and here's some advice. So it's been wonderful working with him. His name is Dr. Alistair Coburn. Um, so Agile, Agile is, a, is a, a, a project management philosophy, basically. It is not a process. It's a philosophy that uh, dictates that you honor change, that you honor people over processes, that you focus on uh, quick deliverables and getting to market over a lot of documentation, that it's really about um, moving forward and making small incremental steps forward rather than spending a ton of time documenting and setting up processes and systems around things. So um, from a marketing perspective, it allows us to uh, pivot very quickly. It allows us to structure our work in a way that uh, is really highly accountable and that we're taking everything into to consideration. And then it's also a, um, it's a way for us to do web design and 
development projects uh, in a way that in also is really collaborative and inclusive with the client. So they're very much a part of all the processes and decisions that we're making. Um, it's a little bit scary for agencies sometimes because there's no sort of going behind the curtain and doing our work and then magically coming out with like, oh, here's your website now and here's your this. We're actually showing work to clients well before we think it's ready to share because we want to get feedback as early and often as possible so that they can, we can not go too far down the wrong path. So if we're working on a homepage design, for instance, maybe we're just showing them, here's kind of the navigational structure we were thinking about. Here's how that might look on mobile. We're not going, here's a Photoshop comp of your entire homepage design, right? So that might be 20, 30 hours into a process, whereas we can put three to five hours into a kind of a navigational structure and kind of start working through those things as a team. Um, so it's really a lot about collaboration. It's about embracing change. It's about planning for change. Um, it's about learning and, and getting a, having a strong feedback loop built into all of the work that you're doing. So you're constantly delivering, improving, getting feedback, you know, cycling through and making things go forward. Uh, it's been really popular in the marketing world. There's entire companies internal that are changing over to the, to the agile processes and uh, or agile philosophy. And then there are some, uh, some basic uh, processes and frameworks that people use to implement Agile's philosophy. So we, we tend to use what would be considered most akin to Scrum. Uh, it means we have weekly sprints. Some people have two-week sprints. They could be three-week sprints or month-long sprints. We do weekly. Uh, we do sprint planning meetings. We do retros. We do stand-ups, daily stand-ups, all these sort of things that are considered the pomp and circumstance of, of Scrum. Um, but there's... Alistair specifically has a, you know, his company is called the Heart of Agile. And he really talks about how in the past, with the rise of, of tech companies, Agile has sort of become aligned with all these different processes, but it's really not about the process, it's about the mindset. And so that's what he considers the heart of Agile. So you can implement any of this, the Agile processes, whether you're Kanban or, or Lean or, or, Scrum, um, but it's really about the heart of Agile, which is the collaboration, embracing change, et cetera. So. Interesting. So you, you talked about kind of like deliverability and speed versus documentation and processes. So yes. as, as an owner, I'm huge on processes because that's how you know, I bring contractors on board, bring team members and train them. How do you balance that uh, at an agency, you know, as one that's growing as quickly as yours? Sure. I think some of it's about building processes that build those things in. So like I said, we now have processes where we don't deliver an entire big visual design all in one fell swoop, or we don't deliver an entire marketing campaign all in one fell swoop. We're kind of vetting vetting the ideas and vetting the concepts. And then we're saying, oh, here's what some copy might look like if we take this approach. Here's what an ad might look like. Here's, the, here's a mood board of the photography we're thinking of. Um, so we're not sort of going, you know, again, back into our holes, developing all the materials and then putting it out into the world. We're sharing each small sort of step that we're making so we can get feedback as early and often as possible. That said, there are definitely places where we have written down processes. We actually keep all of our internal processes in a Trello board or in Google Docs, so they're editable. And we expect that any of our team members who are using a process that has changed, or even if they are changing it while they're using it, that they're updating those documents and we date them and you know, have revision history and things like that. But it's definitely a part of our culture that we, we wanna give people processes so they understand how to do things, that's important, but we also want them to feel ownership over that process so they can change it or adapt it as, it, as they see fit. Um, and then we're constantly looking at efficiencies. So is this process saving us time? Is it taking too much time? How does this fit into the, the overall whole? I think there's stuff like onboarding, like you said. There's things like that that you have to have kind of a step-by-step -step sequence. You need those things in there. I wouldn't consider that type of work to be sort of agile, although we constantly change that based on who we're bringing in and you know, what type of role they're in, that sort of stuff. But, you know, you can't not have somebody meet with the HR person about their benefits like that. That has to happen so this is really more about delivering work to clients specifically okay and and with that being said uh, for me personally with some of the companies that I, I've been working with getting feedback from them it can be a very long and painful process even if it's just a blog post so how have you found that you love your clients I do I love my clients to death but I, I, I feel like we could move so much faster 
Um, so have you like, told how? Them that? <laughs> I I have expressed that. Okay. Um, so how do you, how do you balance like, like moving quickly and making sure that the companies that you're working with are accountable and stay on top of everything? Well, I would love to tell you that all of our clients give us immediate feedback when we want it, but that's not the case. It just doesn't happen that way. But we do have convert. I mean, I had a sales call this morning with a client who just signed on with us and I had a very frank conversation with her. She said, well, how long is this going to take? And I said, I'm going to be totally honest. Our clients are not ever waiting on us for these things. It's always us waiting on them. So we're waiting on you to give us revisions, waiting on you to give us feedback, that sort of thing. But we build that into our process. So if we know if we need a blog post to go live on the 10th of the month, we're delivering it to them by the second so that we can have feedback by the sixth so we can make our revisions and send stuff out. Um, we also have a really um, tried and true sort of weekly touch points with an account manager. So we have weekly reports that go out to our clients that tell them what we did last week, what we're doing next week, and then issues and blockers, what we're waiting on from them, you know, stuff we need. And then a lot of our clients, most of our clients also jump on a 15 minute phone call with their account manager. And so our account managers get to say to them, listen, your delays are impacting our, our speed to make these things happen. And so um, those are non-negotiables. And that's, we know that a client is in jeopardy the minute they start skipping their weekly phone call and then it's bi-weekly and that's been three weeks before we've talked to them. And um, we just know that that's always a sign of, of sort of torpedoing down. So those are kind of a, we don't, it's not in our contract that they need to do that, but we make it very clear during our sales meetings, during our kickoff meetings, all of that, that those things are keys to the success of the business. And you're going to be really eager the first three to five months that we're working together, but then we know how this goes. So we need you to stay on top of it. So, Andy, how long did it take you to, to learn how bringing on someone who's like a scrum master and the other roles internally to make this process work that are non-billable hours. How long did it take you? That's right, good, bad, and the ugly. Uh, how long did it take you to see efficiencies in terms uh, of profitability? We, like how long did that take? That's a good question. We didn't bring on a Scrum Master. So we decided to implement ourselves and decided if we needed to bring on a professional and get professional training, we would do so later, but we're all smart humans. And we knew that we needed to be agile about implementing agile. So we probably don't fit the mold in a lot of ways with regards to what Scrum is and should be, but we have a really diverse client base. And part of us implementing was just, let's make it what works for us and for our clients. So our operations director is billable at about, I'd say 40%. Um, our account managers are billable. All the people who are working are billable. And we've actually built in all of our our agile ceremonies, so our sprint planning, retros, um, stand-ups, those are all billable to clients as well. We have uh, just a percentage. We've, we've done a bunch of analysis on how much time that takes each week. So based on our harvest, our time records, we know exactly how much time the team is putting in, and then we've divided that up. We've determined it's about uh, around 10% of the total project time is spent in our sort of project planning, but that's the time we need to plan your work effectively. That's billable time. We wouldn't be doing it if we weren't working for you. So, Got it. Jordan, is that how you manage your planning time? Do you make that billable? Uh, no, not, not at this either. point. Thanks, time. Andy. <laughs> yep. Yeah. I, after this, I'm going to have to completely revamp everything that I do now. I, I learned early on that any work we were doing on behalf of a client is billable to the client. If we wouldn't be doing something, if you didn't exist, then why would we, you know, we're not, we're not just here to do this for free. You pay us to hire really talented, smart project managers who keep things on the rails. Project management is a billable role at our agency. I think it should be at every agency. Without a great project manager, A, you're struggling to pay good project managers. You're thinking of them as overhead if you're not billing them. And B, they bring more value to a project and to a client relationship, in my opinion, than, than almost everybody. I mean, that's not true, but they bring as much value to a project. They can make or break. They're, they're the like, key point in our client relationship. So um, that stuff is important. Can you go through, you know, when I look at, I know it's a philosophy and not a process, but typically mm -hmm. I've seen it's like goes plan, execute, feedback loop, iterate. Can you... Yep. Talk us through what that process looks like inside your agency. Sure. So we have both a kind of a macro and a micro version of that at our agency. So 
the macro version of that is that when we onboard a new client, especially the first, first time we're, we're doing work for a client, we're spending about six weeks of doing research and discovery. And I think it's pretty standard in our industry. We're going to look, dig through your analytics. We're going to dig through your industry and your competitors. We're going to dig through your conversion rates. We're going to look at all the baseline stuff. We're going to do some surveys of your internal team we're hopefully going to be doing some surveys of your your users or your clients or your customers or whatever that is we're going to be looking at your messaging and all that stuff so right that's first six weeks is really not agile it's really like the research we need to sort of build the, the foundation or build the base then we kind of give you this high level we call it a discovery brief and it's this high level like based on our research here's what we found we think these things are important here's how we're going to position you in the marketplace and here's the sort of tactical elements we're going to use to get you there and then we're going to give you your first quarter's plan and that first quarter is kind of here's the campaigns we're going to build here's the assets we're going to create and then here's the you know content strategy we're going to use we're going to work on these keywords and these rankings and um, then we actually break that down month by month so there's here's your april here's your may here's your june you know we're going to write four blog posts here's the title of those we're going to do you know uh, you know maybe write a ebook or a white paper and we're going to uh, film a video series, whatever these things are, depending on the budget of the client, um, you know, if we have 40 hours or 60 hours or 80 hours, um, that's the kind of the macro level, or sorry, that actually, now we're getting down to micro, but so then month by month, we're executing those, those tactical plans, we um, parse them out week by week into sprints, and so we have, we keep Trello boards, um, let me go back to the macro in a second, because I just want to make sure I'm making a note, all right, so for each client, we take that monthly plan, which we've then, or sorry, quarterly plan, which we've reviewed with the client, gotten sign off, yes, this is the direction we wanna go, we agree with this. Sometimes, and this comes back to being, you know, planning for change, they'll say, oh, you know what, I, why don't we write five of those blog posts in-house, or we have resources that can handle this, or I forgot to share this entire photo library with you. That stuff happens all the time, and so then we'll go, okay, let's throw this in instead, or maybe we can fast forward this other stuff. Um, so we're kind of pu pushing and pulling in and out of the budget for every month. We move that into a Trello board and the Trello board, we create columns for each month. This is the client's kind of big picture Trello board and we're moving to Asana right now. So, but it looks, it looks very similar. Each column has all the cards that are the, each card is a tactic that needs to be completed based on the plan that we have that's in the Google Doc. Um, then each week the team sits down and they drag the tactics over you know we know we have them kind of divided and prioritized and in the trello board they're organized by you know uh the sort of i guess uh dependencies as well so we know we need to get this published by week three so it needs to be written in week one so we can get revisions and get it published in week three um, we pull those each each week when we do our sprint planning meetings that's what happens each team member sits down and pulls over the cards that they need to do for each client we use a plugin called scrum for trello that adds up the numbers that are in the title of each card in trello and so each team member our operations director goes in and looks at each team member's availability for the week so she accounts for doctor's appointments, PTO, you know, anything that they need to account for. So each person has maybe 32 hours available or, you know, 24 hours available or whatever that is. She puts that in the top of their Trello column. And then as people pull over cards, the numbers add up automatically using that Scrum for Trello. So they can see like I've pulled over 40 hours of work, but I'm only here for 24 this week. And so then the team as a whole negotiate how, you know, how high of a priority is this? Does it need to get done? Is there somebody else on the team who can handle it for you? Um, is there something else we can do instead? Those sorts of things. So the team is really active in sort of owning their own work, what they can accomplish and how they can get it done. And then we kind of pay attention to every Thursday, how many cards are left in your column? Are you, you know, you've got eight hours of work left for the week and you've got 14 hours left in your column. Are you going to finish this work? But each team member is absolutely expected to finish the cards that they've agreed to do for the week. So they pull the cards themselves because they have to own that work. They have to get that stuff done. So um, we do keep a column as well for client block. So if something gets sent to a client, it moves into client block until we get the feedback on it. So we kind of always keep an eye on that column and accommodating for that um, in our work planning as well for the week and our operations director helps with that now that's getting down to the micro level let me go back up to the macro level for one second because we I kind of consider the entire first year of 
in engagement with a client is in the planning and executing phase as a whole. The feedback loop and the iteration really happens because we work in so many automation platforms. We're HubSpot partners, so we're doing a lot of campaign building. The feedback loop comes once we've had these campaigns up and running and we've got two, you know, two months or four months or six months of data on these things and we can loop back in and see how they're performing and start adding optimization techniques, looking at landing page layouts, looking at whether the emails are working and things like that. But we need to have enough sort of data to be able to, to create that feedback loop. And so year one is always kind of a build year, year two, year three, year four, which we have a lot of clients who've been with us that long or longer. Um, we're really getting like milking the most out of the campaigns that are just on and working and running for us. So um, that's when things get really kind of sweet because we know what works and what doesn't. Um, and then we continue building new campaigns around, around that, that knowledge. So it's good. Can you share with us, um, not secret sauce stuff, but can you share with us a little bit about how you've engineered your feedback loop and what kind of KPIs you look at as your true north kind of KPIs? And I'm sure it depends per, per kind of vertical, but whatever, share. Yeah. I'd love to learn how you think about it. Uh, yeah, we, um, I don't think there's any secret sauce. And I think that I am hesitant to, I, I really don't think there's secret sauce. I think everything we do, anybody, the, the, the knowledge is out there. It's how you put all the tools together. So I, um, I, you know, we're open books. We'll share everything we do. Um, the KPIs are different for every single client in that feedback loop. We use Databox for reporting, so we're constantly looking at the metrics there. We have our own internal dashboards that we have blasted up on big LCD screens, obviously, in our, in our work area that people are looking at. Um, but we know what industry averages are for open rates and for conversion rates and things like that, and we're paying attention to those things. We do like to pay attention to be, one reason we love HubSpot is that we most of the time get closed loop reporting. So if we can get a client to either use the CRM through HubSpot so we can understand what sales leads are coming in, how many are closing, what they're worth, um, that stuff is what we use as our, our feedback loop. And if not, our team are like voracious about getting access to the sales database, whatever that is. So we actually have clients who send us a spreadsheet at the end of every month with every lead that came in and what the, what its value was, how it closed. We have people who send us, who use, you know, maybe their particular industry's proprietary CRM and we get access to that so we can go in and manually look at how those leads converted so that we can get access to what worked. We don't know, you know, you can see conversions that come in through, um, through Google Analytics and things like that, but you don't know if those things closed. We're not, we aren't, we rarely work on straight e-com types of platforms, and so we have to rely on our B2B clients um, to share that information with us. We wouldn't want to sink a bunch of money into a keyword campaign that, um, not one that converts, right? We want to know that they convert not just into leads, but into sales, because those two are two different things. I just talked with a client yesterday about um, a pay-per-click campaign that he, we were talking about how much he wants to pay per lead. And we talked about the fact that he doesn't mind paying $50 per click if they're highly targeted leads. And it's so funny because you'd hear most, he's worked with two other pay-per-click agencies in the past who are just really focused on getting him. Oops. Of them were worth anything. You know, he's like, I'd rather pay $50 for one than $50 for 20 if it's a good lead. And so we structure the campaigns completely differently knowing that, right? We're going to really focus on the end of the funnel stuff that people are looking for very specifically for what our clients do um, versus looking at the high level stuff. But we also set up really specific ad funnels. I mean, we're using their blog content and their articles and their um, lead gen offers and things too. So it's not just that, but that's a big piece of it. Um, one of our clients, for instance, has a proprietary platform where we can't understand, we can't get direct access from lead to close. And we also know that once they, once somebody clicks a button to go book something on their website, they're taken to this third party platform that we don't have access to. And it's a really pretty miserable and gross experience. And so with that client, we've had to be really clear that we can be responsible for everything up to that point. And so I, it, it actually, it's a little tense and it's, it, it was a struggle for us to say to them, we are not responsible for how many things get booked. We are responsible for how many people 
click this button that says book now because we can't control what's past that button. And so we report on those two things differently. We're still showing them how many people actually followed through and, and made their reservation, but we're also showing them here's what we're responsible for. It's how many people clicked this book now button because that's on their website. We control that. So, um, but it's being smart about that, right? It's like knowing what's in our control and what's not. So you're doing, it sounds like you're doing tons of lead gen and not, we do, yeah. And not okay, because I'm I'm like uh, my all most of my stuff is e-commerce slash local SEO. Mm -hmm. You know those are my challenges that I get in, and I and all the tools that we build are to kind of attack those challenges. Yep, that's really interesting. Um, so how and why did you decide to go into agile? Um, in that direction, I I don't know how we operated before it. It's we're three years in now and. I, I swear to God, I have employees who have been with me longer than that, and they will say to me weekly, I can't believe we got shit done before this happened. Like, I can't believe anything ever happened because we had these, we had a team of 20 people. All the work was just kind of scattered between whoever had time. You know, the point of contact stayed the same, but everything else changed for clients on a pretty constant basis. Nobody really owned their work. It was just getting shuttled around from person to person to person. Things were getting dropped. We reorganized into two cross-functional teams. So each team has an account manager, a strategist, a marketing coordinator, an SEO, pay-per-click, a designer and a developer. And they work as very much a team. They sit and plan their work together. Like they're two, they're the Steve Dragons and the Mana team are the names of them. And uh, they, they're all accountable for the work that gets done. And so there's no, because they work on team boards now, there's no design board and development and then, you know, copy and all these things, nothing's getting dropped. Every piece of the work we do is accounted for. Every micro task is estimated. We know exactly how many hours we're working on something. Uh, we have so much more insight into the work our agency is doing and so much more collaboration with our clients. It has changed everything. So, I'd heard all of these stories of how great Agile was for agencies, yada, yada. Could not figure out how to apply it to sort of our, we're not a big development shop, so couldn't figure out how to apply it to those things that we do that are really, you know, some of this, there's a lot of stuff we do that has specific dependencies. You can't be doing everything on a constant feedback loop. We have to have copy before we do design. We have to have design before we do development. You know, these things that have to happen. It's just that we don't have to have it all at once. Like we can start the copy process and then a week later start the design process. So we have these little overlapped segments, you know, and we're kind of constantly reiterating and going back and making revisions. Um, I don't know how it was worked on web design projects with clients before, but there is not a single one that goes according to that project plan that you set out that first month. Like you can do as much research as you want, but it's never going to be that way because you can have the best copy and the best design. And once you get it in development, you're like, wow, this, this doesn't work. Something's yeah. amiss here. We're kind of, we forgot this, or we, this looks better over here. And then you'd be stupid to say that you can't look at data and two months later recognize that you're not getting the conversions you want and totally change the homepage. Like we never say that our, you know, your first draft is never the best draft of anything you do. So we'd be silly to sit here and say, you know, here's your website, we're done with it. So being agile allows us to really embrace that first draft, second draft, third draft, fourth draft of everything we do and, and gets buy-in from our clients a lot earlier in that as well. The, when you started talking about the two separate cross-functional teams, my mind went straight to, holy crap, that must make it really easy to scale as an agency. Like so in the little building blocks of the structure that you need to get bigger, right? If you wanted to. No, yeah, we're actually struggling with it right now because we can't absorb more work without building an entire another team, but we'd have to have four to five people to build out a whole nother team. And that's a big growth, right? That's not just hiring one at a time. So we're talking right now about like we our, our operations director and, um, and the, you might, business partner and I, Zui, are always looking at like, where are our bottlenecks? And so our team are actually pretty good. We can see it. We get pretty good clarity into where the bottlenecks are and what we start outsourcing. But that's part of having kind of a good vendor list of when you start growing, like what can we send to vendors? What can we, we have trusted partners that we can, I mean, you know, writing blog posts or helping with development or things like that um, to sort of 
help us scale until we're ready to hire. So we know now our next hire, we're bringing on an account manager right now because that person managing the work again is the most important stuff. And then we're scaling up like a copywriter and a strategist, and then we can start scaling up development and you know, those sorts of things. So it really, we really lean heavily on like, where do we, where do we have trusted outside vendors we can use until we're ready to hire? But um, yeah, we're, we're struggling to get past the two teams phase right now. So we're kind of plugging people into those teams and then we'll, I, I'm thinking that we'll kind of pull people out to form another small micro team who then scales. So that's mm. where we're at right now. It might mean some duplicate roles. How many people do you have to have on a team in order to implement this and how many, or, and you can attack it either like, from headcount perspective, I guess, or agency revenue, right, to support, to support it. I uh, I don't like to think it from an agent. Think of it from an agency revenue standpoint. Although I do track that, and I track our revenue per FTE. Um, but for me, it's it's about the hours that are available for people to work. So what I hate seeing the most is when we have one or two people who are in the office late every single night or, you know, working far more hours than the rest of the people on our team. That's just not fair. And so to me, it's a matter of, um, we have, you know, we're a small, small agency. And so we have, there's enough, people know enough about what each other do that they should be able to ask for help. So if somebody's got 60 hours they need to complete this week and you've got 20, how do we spread that around? And so it's actually, the other piece of it is that our team are pretty good at saying, okay, the, let's say the designers are really overloaded this month. Let's hold off on conversion rate optimization and really focus on these other elements of campaign planning that we can do until the designers are you know, off these big web projects, and then we can do some conversion rate optimization next month, that type of a thing. And the teams negotiate that themselves. So for me, for a team to be successful, you have to be able to execute on all the things that you're doing. So if you have an SEO team only, maybe your team is just an account manager, a writer, um, maybe a developer, if you're doing technical or onsite, I don't know what, you know, that's to me, the person who's making the decisions you know, we've divorced strategy from the account manager role, but a lot of, a lot of agencies, those are one and the same person. We just find that uh, having the strategist separate from the account manager allows them to have a little bit of tension around um, that then the client doesn't have to have with the account manager where the strategist can just say, no, we won't make that change because then we're going to lose, you know, we're not going to be successful for you. The account manager can remain sort of the ally for the client and say, well, you know, the strategist won't let me do it. Sorry. You know, and it kind of gives her a little bit of out and power elsewhere. So um, that helps, but in general and agile, they, a, a typical cross-functional team, I think is supposed to be no more than eight to 10 people. I think that's pretty big, but I think you could handle it. I think we'll scale ours are six or our biggest one is seven. One of them is six. So six. What yeah. would you say are some of the big successes that you've achieved after you've implemented it that you didn't think you could do beforehand? Like things that it enabled you to do that you couldn't do before. Oh my gosh. It's a lot to be honest with clients about their budgets. Um, we have so much clarity into where time is spent now. And it's not just because we didn't use to time track. We did. We just didn't have any predictability in where we'd go over budget or what would take more time or anything like that. So we have really specific um, understanding of budgets and, and have uh, it's enabled us to really have good conversations with clients about what we can and can't do. Um, also kind of project planning in a general sense, we can look at our, uh, look at our work that we have scheduled and tell a client we can't start on this until August or we can't start on this until September because we kind of have a decent idea of, of what's in the pipeline um, and how that rolls into how we plan our work, that type of a thing. Um, and then the other one is like we don't, we're not getting things wrong as frequently. So I, you know, any agency who does web design will tell you there's been times where we just present a design and the client's like, oh, God, this is not what I was thinking at all, right? Like, we just don't, that doesn't happen anymore because we never go that far. Um, so we're not burning a bunch of hours and budget. We build time and materials on, on web design and web develop and dev projects. Um, and so it's, it's lessens the risk to the client in a major way and helps really build up trust between our teams. 
I'm hearing partnership is the core. Yeah, absolutely. And I think the structure has an inherent, it, the structure and the, our approach, I think, in, inherently lends itself to building trust between our teams because we're, and we also have, you know, one of our, our number one core values, open and honest always. And so we own our mistakes. We'll tell you when we're wrong. We have no ego around, you know, we've done a whole lot of A-B testing where we have confident that we were, you know, this photo is going to, you know, convert higher. And then the client's idea was to completely right. So uh, we've, we've had that happen enough that we know there's, you know, it's all a best guess until we can get some data behind it. So. Yeah. And then tell us, this is always my favorite part. Actually, it's my second favorite. Tell us about some of your bloop ups while you're implementing agile. Oh my God, there was so, we, I think the whole thing was a bleep up. I mean, when we first implemented, we started with the processes, but we didn't have the cross-functional teams. And so we were trying to uh, implement, but using the same sort of work structures that everything else was. And so we started that in August and I kind of just had set, we had done a lot of research. My partner Zoe and I did a ton of research and I think he's, um, he was a little more hesitant and I just, I kind of was like, all right, we're just going to do this. Like August one, here's what's happening. We're going to have our first sprint planning meeting. Here's how that's going to go, you know? And we kind of just dove in and, and did it. Um, and then January one of that same year, we, is when we kind of converted to cross-functional teams. Uh, I think some of our biggest bleep ups, that's the hard part. I think, um, Hmm. You don't have to be PG, by the way. It's just I sometimes am a little, <laughs> and I figured that I would save Jordan the headache of uh, having to listen to it. Uh, yeah, I'm not usually PG either. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I can't think of any right now, honestly, that are like huge. We screw up all the time. I mean, I just think it's part of the nature of being human. You know, it's. I think it's really about like, you know, our. our our team went today to meet with a client about to talk about some QA issues we're having because we're moving so quickly and delivering, we expect there's going to be errors in the stuff we're sending you. And so most of our clients are kind of a part of the QA process with us. Um, some of them just don't have the time to do that. And so we need to build in a QA process that accommodates that. They don't have time to be like reviewing white papers and making sure there's not grammatical errors in it. That's crazy, right? Um, we hope we don't have to do that, but it's part of, you know, it's part of what we do. So our team went and met with a client today who's been like, ah, we guys have been sending me stuff. It's, we've had so many weird little errors and it's just like one thing after another, but they're all like, when I look at it, they're all totally different. They all have different causes, but the truth is it doesn't matter to her, right? She's seeing the errors. So our team went today and was like, put it all on the table. Like, Here's our, here's how we work. Here's what can we be doing better? How can we work together to fix this? And, you know, Zoe sat and asked her and said, listen, here's what we're going to try. Would you mind experimenting with us? Would you mind helping us work through this problem and giving us feedback while we do it? Um, so I think that's, that's kind of like how we work with our clients is like, Hey, we're trying to fix this for you. We're constant feedback askers. We use a platform called, uh, God, what's it called? It's like a thermostat. Why can't I think of it? I literally just logged into it today. Um, I think it's thermostat.io and it's a like NPS email that gets sent randomly every three months to clients and they can click, you know, one through 10. How do you, you know, do you enjoy working with big C and then they can write a comment if they want. So we're constantly paying attention to like, what's our rating, what comments are coming in from people. Are we, are we hearing the same things over and over again? How can we fix those things? So, you know, that's our own sort of internal feedback loop and that's a good automation as well. So you don't, that you upload your email list and then it automatically sends to people. If they don't reply, it'll send to them more frequently. Um, and if you send to them, um, if they do reply, then it'll, um, it'll send to them at three months later. So you can constantly get that feedback. We we're going to jump into automation. Is that Let's. okay? Cool. So what have you guys automated? I know you're a huge data box fan. I've watched videos of, of you extolling the virtues of it, of working, you know, talking with their, their marketing director. Yeah. But uh, tell us about what automated reporting has allowed you to do. I know that you love your huge monitor when you walk in the office in the morning. <laughs> I've heard you talk about that. Yep. Uh, what else? Or even go into depth about that. I mean, we always talk about the value of automated reporting. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about 
what you love about automated reporting, but also the monitoring and alerting part of it that you guys utilize. Yes, so those are my those are three of my favorite things that we've we've done. We've been on Databacks now, I think, for two two full years. So we embrace its flaws. I think you and I talked about that yesterday. There, are, it's it's got some flaws, like it disconnects from endpoints fairly frequently, and our team get very frustrated. But the truth is, we went from spending three to five hours each month doing reporting for even our small clients to spending half an hour to 45 minutes. So the fact that we're connecting to endpoints, the date range is set, you know, we're sending monthly reports. So on the first, we set the date range to be last month. And then on the first of every month, all the data is updated, right? So that's really easy for the KPIs upon which we are reporting frequently, the traffic, users, sessions, um, conversions, blah, 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 blah. Um, we may or may not create a custom custom board for a specific campaign we're running, or maybe they have some meeting coming up, they want data around something specific. Maybe it's even just a keyword we're researching or a suite of keywords and we're talking about new paper book campaigns or whatever it is. So um, we're kind of adding and subtracting from those reports on a frequent basis, but man, that has, that has really, really, really given us a lot of time back that we can use to either um, we can use to do more marketing for our clients. So, you know, they, they're not gonna pay us more to do more reporting, but they want the data. Um, and so do we. And so, you know, the, the more complex the marketing ecosystem becomes, the more data we have to report. And so we're, even though HubSpot's great, it's not great at reporting and we don't use it for everything. So it's really not great at reporting basic website sessions. So we rely on Google Analytics. And then for our pay-per-click campaigns, we're relying on Google Analytics and AdWords. And we've got a link to, you know, we want data from their social media platforms that we want. So there's no sort of be all end all unless you're using a data box or Tableau or a BI type of a platform that can pull all those different data sources. So that's been good. And now that they've added Google Sheets it's even better because we can add all the data in from their custom or proprietary systems into a Google Sheet and then plug that in as well. Totally. So that's helpful. Now it also sends out alerts. You can have it set up to send daily alerts if you drop below or above a certain, you know, whatever your KPI is. It'll also send you an alert if you're maybe if you are or not going to hit are or are not going to hit goals. So you can set up different goals for the different data you're reporting, and you can have it send you alerts if you're not if you're at you know if you're 80% of the way through the month and you're not at 80% of the goal, it'll send you an alert in that sort of a way. So I'm getting you know six or seven emails. We actually have it connected to our time tracking software and I get alerts every week if our team are gonna hit their billable hours goals or they're gonna meet their tracking goals and things like that. So I can have that data and I can take action before, um, you know, before it's too late, so. And then the boards, the boards that we have up in our um, office are a little bit different. They really have the high level goals up and uh, our team know that I come in in the mornings and every now and then I'll just, <laughs> I stand in the middle of the work area and I kind of watch them shuffle through each, you know, one after the other. And then I start asking questions like, why is this number red? Why is this not, do, you know, doing what it's supposed to do? Why is this so wildly different than it should be? Or why is it way higher? What have we done differently? How can we do more of that? So I, what I want is not for them to feel uh, attacked on their performance, but I want them to have those answers, right? Like we know that this is happening and we need, here's what we're doing about it. So um, that's, that's what those sort of the daily looking at that thing is, is we can, we can at least speak to it. We don't want to send a client a monthly report and it's the first time that we understand that their website traffic is down 30%. Like we should have known that in week one. Um, so those dashboards really help with that in a big way. Have you automated your onboarding process? We have a lot of our onboarding automated, yes. I, in fact, I just closed a contract today, and just by signing the proposal, I had a new project created in our project management software suite, a new project set up in Harvest, and um, a new, no, new document, or sorry, new folder set up in Google Drive and all that stuff. So we use Zapier to do all that stuff as much as we can, absolutely. Cool. Uh, let's see. How... What a, do you have anything? Do you have automation tools that are talking to Merchant Center to get information about product feeds or any kind of issues that are going wrong? In, and I guess you're not doing a lot of e commerce, but we do some, but it wouldn't be me who would have the answer to that, to be honest with you. It would be our both our search marketing strategists who would know that. Got it. I had to implement um, automations around that because the, you don't really get meaningful notifications. 
Yeah, that's and we've noticed that as well. So he he looks and I don't know what he has set up around that, but I know there's some stuff we have set up around click fraud and paper click campaigns. We've got some um, stuff set alert set up on a, a bunch of different things. But part of what we're looking at, um, <laughs> one of my favorite automations we built actually, our search marketing strategist built this last year during one of our hackathons, um, was we built a tool that's a temperature and weather based tool to start and stop campaigns for our clients. So that's one of our fun ones. Have you found have you found that that's helped with ROI? What have been what's been the impact of running a a weather? Yeah, work? absolutely. I mean, so one of the one of the industries that we do a lot of marketing with our family entertainment centers, which are like bowling, laser tag, bumper cars, you know, arcades, things like that. And we work with a couple different chains of them in the southeast. Um, some of them have you know up to seventeen locations. Um, and so setting stuff up like that, if it's raining in the city where there's one of these, yes, people need something to do with their children on a Saturday afternoon. And if you're going to offer me BOGO games of bowling or $10 arcade card for coming in, um, yeah. So, and if we can, we're not going to be working on a Saturday morning and look at the forecast and know that it's going to rain. So, you know, that's, we can only automate that. I love it. And uh, Zapier has a weather, has a weather, trigger right i don't know we didn't even set it up with zapier we just uh we he built a macro or something i don't know what he did i'm gonna be honest with you i don't know but it's tied into like weather underground or weather.com yeah that's cool it might be it could be zapier i don't know why it would be but i have no idea what other automations give it up <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we use HubSpot, so everything's automated. We, I automate every, you know, we use, I use Proposify for our proposals and that automates everything in HubSpot. So I move all our deals in our CRM are based on where the proposal's at and, um, you know, how many times we've, they look at it or if they, if the proposal gets sent, it moves the deals through the deal stage and all that stuff automatically. Um, we have a lot of sales automated emails. I've automated our employee onboarding process. We have a series of emails that I've written um, that I have, as soon as I put in a new employee into the, the email sequence, there's an email that goes out like every four days prior to their start date. It kind of backs up from, I put in their name and then their, their start date and it backs up from there and it sends them uh, all the access they need. It sends automatic emails to the internal people that we need to set up the different accounts on our different platforms and then um, triggers, you know, I have some emails that go out that teach them about our core values and our work processes and our employee handbook and stuff like that. Um, so that stuff all is automated right now, um, which is nice because I was spending a ton of time doing that. Yeah, for sure. Um, have you automated your hiring processes at all? No, we kind of, um, I, some of that, I mean, we, it's built into the, the, some of that is built into the, uh, what are they called? The, the applicant tracking systems that we use. Yeah. Um, but for the most part, the hiring process itself is high touch personal. Yeah. One, but. And I've, I've just been hiring for a couple roles and, and I was shocked at how much time I was spending and I was so busy at the time that I didn't even have the time to consider like, oh, this is a process. These are the steps. These are the micro steps. What should I do? <laughs> yeah. I mean, setting up the templates, even setting up email templates to help with that is, is a step in the right direction. And so that's what we, we have all the email templates to, you know, move somebody to the next stage or decline or all that stuff. So, you know, people do want to be communicated with, especially in that kind of tense situation. So it's important to do those things, but it is it's the hardest part is you hire when you're busy and that's the, that's the worst part of it is like, I don't have time, but I have to do this. So totally. um, yeah, that's, that's where I was at. So um, what I'm hearing to correct me if I'm wrong, I'm hearing that you drive efficiency through, not through group think, but everyone has a vested interest in the agency being as, as efficient as possible. What do you, what do your team members get out of being efficient? Like, how do you motivate them to stay, stay in that mindset? Well, um, I think everybody wants to make, we have a certain amount of work that has to get done every week. And so there's just not really like a choice around that. And mm -hmm. so our operations director, she knows that it's her job to make that make, make it as easy as possible for those people who produce work to produce work. They shouldn't be spending their time, you know, managing the work or managing the process or that sort of thing. Um, but they, their feedback is absolutely vital to making that thing happen. And so uh, we're always listening to um, 
what's where is their blocks what's what's a bottleneck what's not working um, sometimes we've made stuff too efficient and we have to go back to no we do need a meeting about this we need to sit down and think about this and you know we're not doing just SEO marketing and creative they require you know that that feedback loop and that like writing of drafts or creating drafts is an important part of a creative process like we have to be able to to push things out and and to revise them, you know, so we have to leave a little bit of thinking space. And so our team sort of understand that there is, we still have billable hours that pay our bills. And so they know that they have to meet a number of billable hours per week and a number of total hours per week. Um, and and we, they have, because they work all one-on-one -on -one with clients, they have pretty good uh, accountability to the clients because they have to deliver. So I don't know. I guess that's kind of not really an answer to the question, but um, you know, our culture is very, very strongly, uh, you know, we are, we're team based. This is, we're not a top down type of organization. Like I might have wild ideas, but they've got to figure out how to implement it or whether it's worth implementing, which happens a lot. Like I'll come back from a conference and um, my, one of my employees calls it hurricane Andy, where I come in with like just this list of crazy ideas of things we're going to do now. Okay, we're going to do this. And then they, they kind of are pretty good at um, vetting what's worth it and what's not. Is this possible? Is this not that type of a thing? Yeah. Do you, are you going to go to MozCon this year? No. What conferences are your go-tos each year? <laughs> um, so we usually go to stuff through the Bureau of Digital. Um, so I'm usually hitting their owner summit, which is in, I believe, February, January or February. Um, it's an agency owners conference. Um, now and then we go to Inbound. We're not going this year. I think I'm coming back to the agency con in Breckenridge. I had a really fun time there, and I love Colorado, so I have no problem being out here. Um, I'm trying to think. That's about all I have on my calendar right now as far as conferences goes. We're sending employees to things a lot this year. So yeah, well, my travel calendar is pretty big and I speak at conferences a lot. So it's tough because I've got kids and I'm the sole driver to school in the morning. So when I'm out of town, everybody gets taxed. So I feel you. My wife is out <laughs> of town 80 to 110 days a year. Oh my gosh. Yeah. That so is tough. I feel you loud and clear. Yeah. Uh, so Andy, for... I was just going to ask for, for agencies that are looking to implement agile, what are your mm -hmm. top recommendations and next steps? I mean, not everybody's going to be like me, which is like, just go ahead and do it. You know, I am very lucky that I have a team that trust me and trust that I'm going to figure out what things they can't figure out that we're all going to work on it together and they're all going to have input as well. Um, but I would suggest like, um, you can only do so much reading about how other agencies have done it. And that's what I found lacking was I only found one article written like a blog post written by an agency about how they implemented agile, but thank God I did because it had a lot of great insight. And so I was able to kind of take what I knew and what I wanted. And, you know, it was really about focusing on the outcomes, not the input. So what do we want to happen with this and how do we judge if it's successful or not? So um, yeah, that, I guess. Focus on the outcome. Do people um, do, do people reach out to you for help implementing it? No. <laughs> I mean, it just seems like there are so many little micro industries around any kind of overarching strategy or way of working. You know, an example would be like Story Brand. Mm -hmm. We're Story Brand. Cool. Uh, I'm. I've been. I read the book and I've been implementing it as much as I can. But I had, did you go and do the, do the workshop? Maria, our content director is going through the workshop this summer. What are your thoughts? Is it worth it? We're going to find out. I want to hear when you, yeah, do. I will be happy to I share love the podcast. I do too. Yeah. Yes. Um, and not the, I thought that focus on the outcome and not the inputs. You've said so many smart things, but to like boil something down uh, into however many words that is six or seven words that that's yeah. totally cool. Um, we're running out of time here. We're almost at the end of our hour. I just wanted to take a couple minutes before we say goodbye and just talk about what's coming up next. Uh, one of my favorite tool, is that okay? I'm just yeah. here for just a sec. Uh, <laughs> one of my favorite tools that we use is a tool called gather up. Uh, we're really lucky next time to have Aaron, please, dear God, let me pronounce his name, right? Aaron Wykey, uh, who's the CEO of gather up. He'll be joining us to talk about um, autom automation and, and how it sort of works with reputation management. 
Uh, their tool called gather up is one of my favorites. I've used it forever. Uh, we use it to help gather an NPS score. Like I was listening carefully as you were talking about that with thermostat. Um, and also I love the fact that their widgets help you get reviews parsed by Google, it pushes structured data straight through. Oh. To um, and we're actually developing, um, something that'll connect gather up to another API to remove that friction even more. Um, which I'm really excited about, but he's going to be joining us in two weeks. I think that that is July, f excuse me, June 28th, the same, same time, 2 PM mountain standard. And I think that's going to be something that's really fun. And we're also going to discuss how they use automation inside their, their team, which is not an SEO or a dev team, but I think it's really cool to talk to a software company to see how they use automation internally. Yeah, absolutely. That's cool. Um, Andy, I know when I reached out, you were like, what the hell do I have to add to automation? <laughs> and for anyone who's made it through this far of the video, this is the reason. We're doing it. agency automators is about automation, but really it's not a, you know, automation like Agile is, is it's a tool to accomplish a goal, which is to drive efficiency, to have a better outcome, to drive more ROI at less cost for both you and for your clients. So, um, getting an insight into how you work has accomplished that goal. And I think that that's crazy meaningful. Um, how big, a, how big an, I mean, how small can you be and still get this to work efficiently? Like I'm trying to figure out how I can do it with my subcontractors and like, do I need to do it, do a daily stand up? Is it weekly? Is it monthly? If, you know, my model has been kind of just delegating tasks and having a project toolkit and they are siloed, you know, unfortunately, like my team is kind of siloed in what they're doing. And I've built processes and documentation around allowing them all to do what they need to do efficiently. But I'm trying to figure out like how I can get going. I don't know what your thoughts are around that. Yeah, I mean, I would just say, A, our team are also siloed. Like, our developer can't go set up a pay-per-click campaign, and our pay-per-click guy can't go and, you know, write a content strategy. So we definitely also have siloed roles on the team. It's really just about planning the work as a team and being as, as collaborative as possible. And so I would say, A, stand-ups, that's up to you. We were doing them twice a week, and now we're doing them, I believe, they're Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Um, and my team will tell me if I'm wrong on that, but we don't do them every day either just because we have so much insight in the tools we use for project management, Trello and everything else. We have pretty, a lot of insight into what's happening on a day-to-day -day basis. So it's not necessary that we do it, you know, um, do them daily. But I would just say, even if nothing else, you start with the, the ceremonies of Agile before you even become, you know, heart of Agile or like the mindset. Just think about those things. Like, how do we focus on your, you are very focused on processes. How do I focus on people over that? What's best for them? Mm -hmm. Best for our clients? And what's the most collaborative team-based way that we can do this so that everybody's invested in this as, as much as I am? I think that's the important piece of it is that me that this method of organization puts the onus and the ownership on our team more so than on my partner and I, you know, like it's not on our shoulders anymore. We don't have the, we don't have the accountability to the client. They come to us if, you know, shit hits the fan. But other than that, like it's, it's on them. Like the account managers of the team have to have to own that stuff. So I think that's a big, huge, um, a huge bonus to it. But I would say, look at Scrum, you know, I would say research Scrum, Kanban, Lean, look at what process you think works for you and do it. Like start with the process. So start with sprint planning, start with, you know, whatever that looks like for you, and whatever tools you have to do to get there. Um, and then you kind of, your first sprint's going to be a mess. Your second sprint's going to be a mess. Your first month's going to be a mess, but two or three months later, you're going to be, I mean, honestly, I don't know how we worked before we did this. It is, that we have so much clarity and so much foresight and just so much, so much more accountability to each other and to our clients. It's been incredible. The, the operations person that, that we're bringing in has experience with all three versions of, of what you mentioned. Oh, good. And um, which one do you prefer? We use a bastardized version of Scrum. Okay. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, guess what? We did it. <laughs> After our hour, this was really fun. Awesome. I, I, 
I learned so much about about the process and I just have been looking forward to spending time with you for it's been like three or four months, right? <laughs> it's been a while, yeah. <laughs> We've been talking about this, so it's like super great that we finally executed it. Yep. Jordan, any parting shots? Um, just one quick question, Andy. What's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Sure. So our website is big C B I G S E A dot C O and I am I don't know my Twitter handle. I'm like rarely on Twitter. It's either Andy Graham BSD or it's a Graham BSD. One of those is Instagram and one of those is Twitter. I don't even know. We'll um, add it to the show notes. All right. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Andy, thanks so much. Jordan, Rock Thank you so much, Andy. Yes. Thank All you guys. Very shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thanks guys. Cheers. Bye. Bye.